Hello, and welcome to lecture 25 on the topic of images formed by lenses, okay? Specifically, thin lenses, which you can see here in the title. This is the third lecture covering optical images. Those have been images formed by refraction, which was lecture 23, images formed by reflection, or mirrors, which was lecture 24, and now finally, the last of the three, images formed by lenses, because there's kind of the most going on here. Not that it's any more complex. It's just the natural progression of ideas. This is not the end of our lectures on optics. We still have a few more lectures following up to conclude our section on optics, but we're getting very close to the end. Now let's, let's look at our objectives for this image on thin lens, on thin lenses, or images formed by thin lenses. Okay. So our objectives are to understand that thin lenses are an ideal approximation of two circularly curved refracting surfaces. Okay, so definitely there's going to be refraction involved. It's circular again, like we saw with our mirrors. Okay, and it's ideal. So we don't, it's, there, there's a small angle approximation that we want to derive, but there is a simplification here. Okay, we've seen that before. Very much What's so important about this lecture is because it's the third of the three lectures on images, I'm going to be building on that other information. So it's really better to watch those lectures first if you haven't already. Those are lectures 23 and 24, because I'm going to assume that you know much of this stuff, although some of it will be repeated, but it's still so helpful to have already have that foundation. Our second objective is to learn that thin lenses create images based on the principles of refraction, but with very similar convention, conventions as for curved mirrors, okay? So that's, that's relevant, okay? So it's going to be a lot like curved mirrors. Should we should expect you know, a lot of similarities, okay? We want to learn that lenses come in two types, converging and diverging, okay? And that each type of lens can be created by a variety of combinations of refractive surface radii. What I mean by that is there's more than one way to make a lens. There's a typical way, and you, you've seen it in a textbook. If you look, to, look at your physics textbook at all, there's a typical look to the converging lens and the diverging lens. But then there's also an atypical look. And it's important to acknowledge why you can have a converging lens that both looks like one and maybe doesn't look like one so much. But that is a somewhat a secondary idea. The primary idea is let's work with those principal rays. Let's work with the equation for forming images with a known focal length, okay? And if that sounds a lot like mirrors, it should, okay? So let's go ahead and define thin lenses, all right? What is it? Well, it's a simplified lens with simple rules for image formation, okay? That's kind of, that's the goal of it, all right? It's a, it's the, the most ideal case we can come up with. The, the approximation comes down to this. This is what it is in a nutshell. And again, I'm, we're not gonna be deriving why this works for small angles, but I want you to at least conceptualize what's going on. So true refraction would occur from at both interfaces of changing refractive index. So if this is all air around our lens, and this of course is our lens here, kind of looking like a lens in a camera, right? Or maybe the, you know, even a biological lens. So there would be refraction occurring when we go from lower to higher, if N1 is less than N2, N2 being the refractive index of the lens. There would be refraction towards the normal as the ray of light goes into, say, the glass, and then there'd be refraction away from the normal when the ray exit the, exits the glass back into the air, right? So then that refraction, there'd be a, a two-fold change of angles. The relationship between the two refractive angles would depend on how thick the lens is, because it would depend on this angle and on the particular wedges of the circle. So it'd be quite complex because it would not be the same up here as it would be in the middle. And actually the rays would not converge exactly because a lot of times we'll be looking at how these rays will over will cross each other or we'll be extending the, um, the rays that don't cross each other. The, the diverging rays will be taking extensions of those to find that virtual origin of the diverging rays. But regardless, in this case of true refraction, it would be complicated, it'd be messy. All right. And there would be no absolute focal point. But simplified refraction says that this lens is so thin that we can just have one line right down the center and just have a single instance of refraction occur. That means that all the rays anywhere up and down the length of the lens will all behave the same. We'll get perfect focusing or perfect diversion of those rays. And that's the simplification that we make. That's the thin lens approximation. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's a sim simplified so that the lens thickness is negligible and thus only a single incidence of refraction occurs. Okay, there's just one right down the midline. No defined thickness, okay? Defined radii, yes. We do, we do care, for example, what the radius is. Maybe, you know, this is the radius. But 
we don't care what the thickness is, all right? The curvature of the lens faces left and right are circular, right? Not parabolic, nothing else. It's all based on circular geometry. And like images formed from by refraction, okay? That would be back in lecture 23, but with two radii and a defined focus. Now I bring that up because physically, the actual physics at play here is of course refraction, just as it was in lecture 23. The difference there is that you had one interface, say N1, you had maybe a curved surface, and you had N2. You never returned back to N1, such as air. In this case, obviously the ray starts in air, goes through glass, and goes back to air. All right, so in that case, you might think, oh, it's more, more difficult than refraction. There's a whole extra step. But of course, we simplified away that extra step by having our thin lens approximation. And so what that means is that actually, in many ways, it's less complicated than the the, um, the image formation by refraction in lecture 23, because we get this defined focus. And as we saw with lecture 24 and mirrors, having a defined focus makes for really elegant equations, very straightforward calculations, as well as good ways to check your work with ray diagrams, okay? So it's kind of interesting how we can add that other surface and get something that works so well. In other words, going from general refraction, where there was no defined focus point, to that of thin lens refraction or image formation, okay? So now on to the two types of lenses, converging and diverging lenses, okay? So converging means bring together, diverging obviously means send apart, okay? So the converging lens, this is a lens that is capable of converging rays, so causing actual rays of light to pass over each other. What type of image does that sound like? I bet you know, if, especially if you watch previous lectures. Any lens that is thicker in the middle is converging, okay? Any lens. So this right up here is your very typical look for a converging lens. The ones that look like this, right, kind of like a squinting eye, that's what most textbooks, most websites will represent as your, con your converging, at, converging lens, okay? All right? But it just has to be thick in the middle. It doesn't have to exactly look like that. Converging lenses can also cause rays to diverge depending on the location of the object position relative to the focus. Oh, that's interesting. So a converging lens can actually be a diverging lens. Huh, when, when does that happen? Well, it's just like a concave mirror. Because if you recall, concave mirrors could create both real and virtual images depending on where the object was relative to the focus. If it was inside of the focus or outside of the focus, we got different types of images, okay? Same idea here, okay? And in fact, same relationship. All right, but we'll see, we'll see that at play where, where the object creates different images, okay? All right, and here is just a, um, a good summary is that by definition, so, so important, is all converging lenses by definition have a positive value of focal length. Because remember, sign conventions are such a big deal. And I'll summarize the sign conventions for lenses below, okay? And of course, I'm gonna compare them to previous sign conventions we've seen, I've been doing a lot of that. But the important thing to remember in the context of lenses, converging means positive focal length. And now let's look at this diagram here, summarizing the rays. Here we have an object. Here we've got principal rays, three principal rays. This type of converging lens is called biconvex because both of the circular refractive surfaces bend away. So they're both convex, all right? S is the object distance from the midline of the lens. S prime is the image distance from the midline of the lens, right? The focal length is here. The focal length is defined as positive for converging lenses. That's interesting because notice how the focal length is defined on the opposite side as the object, right? The object. So that, that's hinting at a, a sign convention there, okay? But I'll, of course, reiterate that in just a moment. And there's our real image being formed, just like all real images, no matter how they're being created, this real image is inverted relative to the object. Okay? Excellent. All right. Now let's quickly summarize diverging lenses, because obviously there's a lot of crossover and ideas. It's a lens that can only cause rays to diverge, whereas the converging lens could create convergence or divergence. Not so with the diverging. It's limited. All right? It's any lens that is thinner in the middle, like this one, right? Thinner in the middle, thicker on the ends. Okay, and this is the typical look of one. Like a convex mirror, all right, that's a mirror that bends out, it creates only virtual images. Ah, so see, see the, the similarity here? Converging is kind of like concave, diverging is kind of like convex, all right, because there is some definite analogies there, okay? And every diverging lens, by definition, has a negative focal point, all right, or a negative focal length, okay? Well, let's draw some rays on this diagram right here, okay? 
let's put in our object. That's this one here. Right? The, the taller one is the object. Okay. Notice that I have the focal length on the same side as the object. Notice that the name here is by concave, by for two, right? Notice that the principal rays are labeled. It's always a little bit harder to draw them when you're interior of the focal point. We've seen that with mirrors, but you got to work out what the definitions mean. Okay. And we also have the radii, all right? Because after all, all lenses are, have a defined left and right radius. So this would be the, the left one is R1, reading from left to right, and this, the right one is R2, okay? Definitely a virtual upright image here, okay? Not a real image, all right? There's the distance S prime. This is to the image, okay? S is shown as there, okay? So there we got it. Now notice also that I labeled the sides, negative and positive. That's because anything on the same side as the object is defined as negative. Anything, whether that's S prime, all right, there we go, S prime, F, R1, or R2. Any of those values, if they're on that same side as the object, they are negative, okay? All right, if anything is on the opposite side of the lens, it's positive. That's interesting. Where have we seen that sign convention before? For images formed by refraction, okay? But this is the opposite sign convention for images formed by mirrors. Why is that? Well, because it didn't make sense to have things positive on the other side of the mirror. No actual light was going there, okay? Here, the real light is going to pass through the lens every time, right? Whether it diverges or not. So positive is associated with real, okay? All right? It's interesting because then that we actually have a negative magnification whenever it's real. But you got to still think about what the sign conventions mean. All right, well, here are all uh, three of the key formulas. One of them is, two of them are very similar, just different, different versions of the same formula. This one should look strikingly familiar because it's the same exact formula we use for object images and focal length as for mirrors. Just now there's, slight, there's slightly different sign conventions, okay? But once it should make sense. S is the object distance, measured in meters. S prime is the image distance, measured in meters. F is the focal length, also a distance, measured in meters. M is the magnification. And I've, I've, I've definitely stressed this point before that no matter what system you're talking about, magnification always has the same meaning. It is a universal sign convention. All right? Well, sign convention. Anyway, so positive is upright. Negative is inverted. All right? Positive being upright means it must be virtual because you can't have an upright image that isn't virtual. And negative being inverted means it must be real. Okay, and then if it's greater than one, it's or less than one, it's smaller. If it's greater than one, it's larger. Okay, so that's the meaning of magnification. Obviously, dimensionless, just a number m, because it's the ratio of negative of the image distance over the object distance. Okay, all right, excellent. And that negative is there so that if you have a negative s prime, the negatives cancel, you end up with positive. What does positive mean? Upright and virtual. Aha, that means you got to be on the negative side to be virtual. OK, because that's that's the way that all these convention systems work. Now, these next two equations here, I think they're very, again, very similar. They're both the lens maker formula. The point of the lens making maker formula is to find F. All right. Because often F is, is already given to you, but sometimes you might need to solve for F. But knowing the radii of the lens. So if you know the left and right radii of the lens, and you know the index of refraction of that lens, then you can actually find f. So that's the idea. It's a, it's an adjustable value. You can you can build the lens. Hence the name of the formula, the lens maker formula. Okay, n is the index of refraction of the, of the lens. Here it's just n because in this case this is a lens that's surrounded by air. Right, the upper is for a lens in air. That's this formula up here. All right, but in this case, you notice there's an n two. Well, now I've just relabeled n as n two because in that case there needs to be an n one. Right because the lower one is when the, the lens is surrounded by a fluid with index of refraction of N2, all right? So, or N1, excuse me, N1, because N2 is the, is the material, all right? So you see it here, clearly the lens is N or N2, and then N1 is the fluid that surrounds the lens. If it's air, it doesn't matter because it's just one, right? And the one, the one just, you know, it's the one in the denominator would have no effect, so just simplify to this, right? But if it's water, then obviously that matters, and you need to figure that into your calculation, all right? And this should say N1 right here, index of refraction N1, okay? All right. And now the table for all the sign conventions for a lens. So if you're tired of comparing between the different systems, mirrors versus lens, then you can just have a good summary table right here, right? So the variables, image distance, radii, right? Whether it's the left or the right radii, and the focal length. 
If any of those are on the same side as the object S, then they are negative. If any of them are on the opposite side as the object S, then they are positive, okay? And what, is it, what does it mean to be on the same side for radii? Right. Well, it, it where it's where it's where the actual radii exists, like pointing from the center. Okay. So in the case of convex, this would be a radii on the opposite side. So this would be a radii that's positive, greater than zero. Okay. In the case of concave, right? Then that radii has to point from the center of that curvature, right? And then that this this could be r, and it would be less than zero because over here is s. See, that would be on the same side. Okay, so concave on the left is going to correspond to negative radii. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Okay, so again, just say like, for example, this one here, this would be R1 less than zero. All right, this one over here would be R2 greater than zero. See so, yeah. Okay. All right, let's get on to practice. All right, two types, because I think the one you either have problems that we have to consider the lens maker formula or ones where you don't. So I think naturally we should split those into two types. So type one are problems that involve real or virtual images formed by converging or diverging thin lenses of circular curvature and particular focal length. Okay, so all the all the, the simplifications that we have. Type two are problems that involve relating the focal length to the radii of the left and right circular curved surfaces of the thin lens. That's using the lens maker formula. All right, and then, then you might have to follow up and actually make an image calculation. So basically do a type, type one combined with a type two. Okay, let's do our first one, example one. All right, we're gonna kind of compare between two cases where we have an object and a focal length and we just change the type of lens, all right? So an object with a height of 12.3 centimeters is placed 16 centimeters in front of a thin converging lens. The focal length is 33.9 centimeters, okay? All right, so where is the image of the object form and what is the image, image's height and type? Okay, so we're starting with that thin converging lens. We'll start with this one. Okay, so things to note, all right? So I'm obviously gonna show, show it to you, but it's gonna turn out that having an object right here, right, and an S like that, means that our image is going to be upright, right, which means it must be virtual, okay? It's going to have a magnification that is larger than one because it's taller, all right, all right. So we're definitely going to have an S that is, or an S prime that is greater than S. So it's further away from the lens than the than the object is. The image is further away. That is, and it's larger. Okay. So that's that's what we're going to get from this case. And where that all kind of come from? We'll consider the magnitude of S compared to the magnitude of F. Right. S is smaller than F. So having our object inside of the focal length essentially for this converging lens means that we end up with this type of virtual image, okay? So positive focal length since it's a converging lens. All right, here is our formula, right? Just the relationship between object, image, and focal length. We're gonna just uh, start solving for S prime by isolating it, subtracting one over S from both sides, take the reciprocal of both sides. Now we're ready to plug in our values. Obviously, there's our focal length, 33.9, positive. There is our object distance, the 16 centimeters that was given in the problem, okay? And we end up getting negative 30.3. So indeed, it is further from the lens, right? About about twice as far. And, right, is it gonna be taller? Is this, does, is how are we gonna show this H prime? Well, first note that it's, the focal length is less than zero. It's a negative focal length. By definition, negative, negative focal length means um, that, uh, oh, I see, sorry. This should say S less than zero. No, nope, that's his typo. That's just say S less than zero. So negative image length means virtual. And every virtual image is upright. So we know right away it's upright. But we can kind of confirm it's upright because if we go to our calculation for magnification, which is negative S prime or S, we plug in that S prime that we solved for, being negative after all, it cancels, and you end up with a positive magnification, all right? And then we can go ahead and use that magnification to find the new height because H prime is just the product of M in the original height, H, and you know, multiply them together. And we have 23.4, indeed it's taller, all right? It's taller by a factor of 1.84, all right? And again, having a positive value of M means upright, but we know that because it's virtual, you know, so it's just a way of kind of confirming the results. And again, I need to change this to S less than zero, that's a typo, okay? Let's go do it with part B now, because the only thing that's different in part B is we're just gonna replace our lens with a diverging lens. Same focal length, same object distance, okay? So let's do it. So now we can see it's inside. And notice the way that this is working, right? Notice that 
When I drew the converging lens, I drew F on the opposite side. That's because by definition, the focal length is positive. Notice when I drew the diverging lens, I drew F on the same side as the object, right? The magnitudes of the distance haven't changed. It's still, after all, the same focal length, but its point has changed because we have to follow the conventions, okay? And that would come up or be most relevant for ray tracing purposes, like where you put that what that focal that focal point. Sometimes it's called the primary focal point because sometimes we'll draw them on both sides to make it symmetric because after all the lens is, um, at least the focal, focal points are, even if the curvatures are not. But um, other times we don't need to. And notice here that I haven't done a ray tracing. I wanted to just focus on showing the relative sizes of S, S prime, H, and H prime, and didn't want to cloud things up with ray tracing. We'll be doing more of that in just a minute. All right. And you definitely want to get practice with ray tracing. Okay. So finally, let's run through part B with our diverging lens, but nothing else changed. Notice what's going to happen here, right? We're still going to get a virtual image. We better, right? Because diverging lens, lenses can only make virtual images. But our virtual image isn't as far away, nor is it as, that, as different, right? So it's just a little bit smaller and a little bit closer to the lens than the object is, all right? So notice it's shrunk. H prime is smaller than H. And S prime, the distance to the image, is a little bit closer to the lens than S, okay? The distance to the object. This time, our formula is going to look like this, so same darn formula, solving for the image distance, but it's a negative focal length. That's all that's changed. So all we've changed is just putting a negative. That's The negative is so important, though, because look at the difference in results. Now we get an S prime of negative 10.9, right? And, of course, where S is about 16, yeah, or is 16, okay? And virtual because, um, and again, this should say because S is less than zero, all right? I just for both times I wrote F, but I meant to write S, right? So these say S less than zero, S prime, excuse me, S prime less than zero, S prime less than zero, because a negative S prime means virtual, okay? And then we'll go ahead and find the height of the image, all right? Replace M with negative S prime over S. I'm just kind of combining steps as I didn't, um, similar I did in part A, right? So then replace um, the, uh, the variables with values. Here we have that same cancellation of a negative. So we get our upright image, but it's about half the height of the object. The object, um, well, actually the object was 12.3 centimeters. So it's it's shorter, right? But not, not by a factor of one half, okay? So notice here that the magnification is greater than zero. So it's upright. We know it's upright, okay? But we knew it was upright because it was virtual. Two ways of saying the same thing. Okay, good. So there's our first example, no ray tracing, just focusing on two different ways to create a virtual image. We created a virtual image with a converging lens. We created it with a diverging lens. When we created the virtual image with the converging lens, it was big, okay, bigger than the object. When we created the virtual image with the diverging lens, it was smaller than the object. Interesting trends there, okay? All right, here, we're gonna work with the converging lens, but we're just gonna move our object. So we're gonna start with a distance of S1, and we're gonna finish with a distance of S2, okay? Notice that I, I kind of redrew it to scale because I made my S2 not as close as it should be based on the values in the body of the problem. So I just, I just moved it a little bit for clarity that could because I wanted to do ray tracing that works out. Because if, if your values aren't good for your curvatures and your distances, then your rays aren't going to match up accurately. So that's why I did a little, look for a little fix there. Um, furthermore, I want to point out that here I'm only doing two of the three rays. And that's because I'm not, I'm not trying to do a full ray tracing here. We're going to do a concept question, check of that in just a moment. Here I just wanted to do a basic ray tracing because you only need two to cross. The third is just more for, for further confirmation to get that, that better accuracy. You feel good about having your image correctly drawn. Okay. All right, so the, the pink ones are for the original location. In that case, notice that we're creating a real inverted image. That's S1 prime. But then when we move S2 over to here, all right, we move it interior. See, because S2 is, has, is smaller than the focal length. So we moved it inside the focal distance because this would be F right, somewhere right here. Then what type of image do we get? Well, just like in the previous example, we're going to get a virtual upright image that's bigger. All right. Interesting, interesting, okay? Now you're gonna find out a really interesting result about these relative sizes, because it looks like maybe S2 is a little bit bigger than S, S prime, or S2 prime is a little bigger than S1 prime. That actually shouldn't be the case, and we'll see that in just a second. Just, it's just because ray, ray tracing isn't perfect, okay? You know, especially when your scales aren't perfect. Okay, so what, what's the problem asking though? So you have an object that's H tall, it's just a placeholder, we're not gonna do anything with a number there. All right, and it's a, we have a converging lens with a focal length of five centimeters. The object is moved from a position of, well, F plus five, so that's eight centimeters, to a position of five minus three, so two centimeters, all right? By what factor does the magnitude of the magnification of the image change, all right? So that's just gonna be 
M2 over M1. And does the type of the image change? Well, clearly, right? I, based on ray tracing, it should, okay? All right, so let's run through the, the numbers here. So just find the values of M1 and M2, right? Based on the formulas. And then take that ratio of M2 over M1, okay? So then I'm going to rewrite this. I'm kind of combined it all in one equation because I know that S1 prime is found through this expression right here. Well, actually, just, just this one, okay? That's S1 prime. And then S2 prime is, well, actually, S1 prime is just this bit, sorry, okay? And then S2 prime is just going to be this, okay? That's just solving from the image equation, okay? And so then we can go ahead and plug in all our numbers and acknowledge that, indeed, when we do plug in those numbers and we take the reciprocal, that then this this becomes S2, all right? So this is this is the image distance once we've moved it, and then we have our virtual image, which is why it's negative, see? And this is S1. This is where when we were still creating the real image, okay? Okay, so that's cool. We can see S1's pretty far away from the, from the lens. S2's pretty close in the case where it's virtual, all right? But what ends up happening with our ratio of magnifications, check it out, it's one. It, they're, they're actually the exact same size, right? S, S2 prime and S1 prime have the same height, right, in terms of their magnitude. It's just that they, the negative here represents that one is flipped upside down, right? The negative in the ratio means one's inverted relative to the other, okay? And then finally, to answer part B, yes, definitely the image type change has changed because the image is real and inverted when S is greater than F, and the image is virtual and upright when S is less than F. Right? And that's always the case for converging lenses. That's what I hinted at a moment ago. You know, what's the rule for when converging lens, lenses create real, real images versus virtual images? Well, here it is. There's the rule. Okay. All right. So talk about talk about rules. We got our ray tracing. This is going to break things down to in terms of the principal axes or um, you know principal rays that that I introduced in the previous lecture in lecture 24 on mirrors. Right. Same exact principal rays. We can apply them to the lenses. All right. So here are the three principal rays applied to an object for a converging lens inside the focal point. The result is a virtual upright image, okay? And we can see, right, we're crossing all three of them, okay? Notice, you know, the, the sign convention, anything on the same side of S is negative, anything on the opposite side is positive. Most, most things in this case end up being uh, negative, except for F, right? Over here, we have, again, a virtual upright image, all right? It's closer to the, to the lens, than the object and it's shrunk down, right? We've seen that trend before, but here what we're seeing is I'm showing all three of the rays, right? The rays that follow the three rules. And you're like, oh, those are, those are the rays, but, but you know, how, what, what good is that? These seem kind of complicated. Well, they all have their rules, okay? So the three principal rays, and this is very similar wording to the wording I used for mirrors, except here the wording applies to refraction caused by thin lenses. So ray one is the one that passes through the center of the mirror and optical axis and just follows the law of refraction this time. But here, the law of refraction gives that the angles are the same because it, the way it's passing right through the midpoint means that they're, they're equal angles. All right. The principal ray two is parallel to the op optical axis on incidence and then refracted in the direction of the focal point. OK. And sometimes if you're on the other side of the focal point, you have to kind of do a continuation of where that ray, ray would be refracted from. But that still that rule always applies. And finally, principal ray three passes through the focal point on incidence and then is refracted parallel to the optical axis. And again, if you're inside of the focal point, then you have to you know, extend that, you, know, you obviously can't pass through the focal point, but you can say, okay, what's, what's a ray that's emanating from the focal point, all right? And that, that's like the idea you know, that I'm doing, doing over here in terms of having something emanate from the focal point, okay? All right, or same thing here, see? Okay, so practice, pra make sure that these rays make sense to you. You have to get practice with them because just looking at them is you'll never learn how to draw them accurately. You have to make sure you're drawing them yourself. So you're you're coming into those coming across those hurdles that force you to make the make sense in your own way of the rules for these different rays. Okay. And speaking of making sense um, of things for yourself, this table here is useful. I'm gonna you know I have my own solutions for it that I'm gonna obviously you know put here in the notes. But it's really best use if you can fill it yourself, right? So you want to be able to fill out this table yourself. Okay memory or a little bit of looking at your notes, do it a couple times so that you feel comfortable with these relationships. Because we have in the different rows, we've got an object outside the focal length of a converging lens, inside the focal length of a converging lens, outside the focal length of a diverging lens, and inside the focal length of a diverging lens. So really, these are the four cases that we can come up with, okay? And these are all the results. When we get real images, which are always inverted, when we get virtual images that are always upright, 
The rules for magnification are very interesting, all right? They're the most, there's the most going on there, but then we can also think about the sign conventions, okay? So definitely be able to come up with this information for yourself, and this is a good reference, okay? But here's a concept question that's just a, a good one to segue into the last couple of examples that have to do with the lens maker equation. And that's that whole idea of when is a lens converging and when is it diverging? Because it's sure, you know, you can sure have a lens that looks like a converging lens or looks like a diverging lens. You know, the, the poster examples being these two at the ends, but what about everything in between, okay? Well, let's think about it. The rule is if it's thicker in the middle, it's a converging lens. If it's thinner in the middle, it's a diverging lens, okay? So we just check if it's thicker or thinner in the middle, okay? So that means that the first one is definitely converging, right? That's clear cut. This one's still thicker in the middle, so it's converging, second one, second over to the right. So we continue to move to the right. We have another converging lens, but more subtle, right? And then we've got one that's neither, because the net refraction is zero, right? This would actually do nothing to focus the rays. Any, any ray that came in at a certain angle would just continue at that angle, right? So if I had a ray kind of come in at this angle, it would just continue at that angle, because the two refractions would just, you'd end up exactly where you're at, okay? Because they're exactly matching radii. Okay, but then we get onto this one. What do you think? If it's flat on one side, is that still a lens? Sure, it's a diverging lens. Okay, because you still have circular curvature on one side, you just have an infinite radius on the other side. And then you've got another diverging lens, definitely thinner in the middle, two circular curvatures. Okay, so now that's great. We've got an idea of when they're converging, when they're diverging. Let's let's put it put it to practice with a couple examples that involve the lens maker equation. Okay, so for a converging lens with two curved surfaces, the radius of curvature for both has a magnitude of 13.1. Interesting, a magnitude of 13.1, but it's a but it's a um, converging lens. Okay, so if the focal length is 16.5 centimeters, what must be the index of refraction of the lens if it's surrounded by air? So wow, so I'm asking you for what what do you have to make the lens out of if you want to achieve this focal focal length? Okay, so we're going to use the lens maker equation with n2 equal to n air equal to one, which means that we're just using this version of the lens maker equation, the one that just has only the index of refraction of the lens itself because everything else doesn't matter. Okay, and we're going to solve for n. So you know, we know all everything else. We know the radii, okay? So, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Just do some algebra. All I did there was just um, basically distribute distribute the um, the this expression here, right? And then subtract it from both sides. Or, you know, actually, first thing I did was cross multiply. So I took this this here and I cross multiplied. So I ended up with the reciprocal of the sum of these reciprocal radii, okay? So that's and that's why it's attached to one of the f. Then the last thing I did was just added one to each side because I had my n equals n minus one on one side. So there's that plus one. Okay, and now we're going to plug in the values. Notice the values, okay? The focal length is positive because it's converging lens. And the, the only way for the focal length to be positive is for the converging lens to look something like this, okay? Okay, well, you think about it then. R1 is the, is the, first, the first radius, and that's the radius for the surface that's on the left. So that means that this must be R1. Well, then R1 must be positive because it's opposite of S, see? Okay, and then we've got r2 right then that's for the surface on the um on the right okay well r2 would have to point this way this would be like r2 well is r2 on the same side of s or the opposite side same side so that means r2 must be negative okay so r1 is positive greater than zero r2 is negative but that's great because that will give us the positive focal length that we'd expect from a converging lens because look we got a positive value here and then we're subtracting a negative value, which means we'll end up with everything positive inside the parentheses. Okay, so that's that that that's actually converging lenses that look like that, even though they have one of their radii is negative. That just serves the purpose of having a positive focal length in a sense. Okay, but anyway, in this case, we know them right, and we, and that's we know one of them has to be negative to get it to be a converging lens. So yeah, it's kind of interesting reasoning out there, and then we can then go ahead and solve for the index of refraction, 1.4. So like glass. Okay, great. But now we're going to take that lens and we're going to put it in water. All right. In that case, the surrounding fluid has an index of refraction of 1.33. Well, how does that change our conditions? Okay. All right. So here's the situation now. Right. We still have our R2 and our R1. Again, you can clearly see which one is positive and which one is negative. See? Uh -huh. And now we have a surrounding index of refraction that matters. Okay. So in this case, the lens maker equation becomes this version here. Okay. All right. Remember, N1 is the surrounding index of refraction, N2 is the index of refraction of the lens itself. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and solve for N2, right? The expression looks really familiar, but a little bit different. We obviously have a different value up top and we're not adding one instead of adding N1. Plug in all the numbers and look, it's definitely gonna be bigger. N is being 1.86, okay? So definitely you need a material with a higher index of refraction to achieve the same focal length. That makes sense, okay? Because you you're, bending, you're bending not as much because you're not bending from air, you're bending from water, okay? Okay, great. 
Let's do our final example, example four. Okay, lens maker equation, then actually talk about the images that are made by the lens that we make. Kind of cool. So a lens, uh, a lens uh, maker, I guess, should I maker, wishes to design a meniscus lens, right? And that, that's the term given a particular look of lens. You'll, you'll see what they look like. Uh, with curvature on the side of the object of R1 equals 14.5, so positive, and curvature on the opposite side of R2 equals 8.65, so also positive. Oh, that's interesting, because remember, before R2 was negative, so this lens is going to look different, but it's still converging, all right? And then the next refraction is given here. We're not solving for it. It's 1.5, okay? And the lens is surrounded by air, right? So, okay? So what is the focal length of this lens, and is it a converging or diverging lens, okay? Well, here's the picture. All right, so both R1 and R2 are positive, which means they both have to be opposite of S. So that means that the curv curvature has to look like this. Well, that's why it's called a meniscus lens, right? Because any lens that looks like this, where they're both, they're both curved in the same direction, that's what, that's what people mean when they say a meniscus lens, lens, okay? Now, this one definitely is diverging. We can kind of tell just by the way we drew it, because if we look at it, it's definitely thinner in the middle and thicker on the ends, okay? All right, excellent. And what's interesting about this is, is you kind of you can you can you know kind of justify that, but you might want to check it. Maybe your drawing could be a little deceptive, right? So I wouldn't I wouldn't trust the drawing 100%, you know, because it kind of depends maybe where you put them, you know, or how accurately you draw the radii. But there's certainly you know, there's there's a there's a telltale result here, okay? But we can find out why it has to be by go ahead going ahead and solving for the focal length, okay? So we're going to use the lens maker equation, and we're just going to solve for f which just, uh, just involves taking the reciprocal of both sides, right? So I just raise both sides to the power of negative one, okay? So when I do that, I get one over 1.5 minus one, all right? Plug in the two positive value of radii, and sure enough, I get a negative focal length, okay? Yeah, so negative focal length tells me it must be a diverging lens, so the fact that I drew it thinner in the middle checks out, and that means that the focal length is on the same side of S, and that's why I went ahead and drew here. So diverging lens, okay? All right, that's diverging, very good. Okay, so in part B, we're going to go ahead and say if we place an object at 7.7 .7 centimeters, so there it is, okay, um, from the lens, where's the image located? Well, we know it's going to be located on the same side because diverging lenses can only create virtual images. So let's go ahead and find S prime, okay? So set up the equation for image formation, all right, solve for S, S prime, and plug in the numbers, all right, there's our negative focal length that we found in part A, there is the distance of the object, okay? And we get, obviously, a negative value for S prime, negative 6.53. So a little bit closer, all right? We definitely expect that with diverging lenses, so checks out, okay? Okay, so finally, part C. Part C, I asked for the magnification of the image, okay? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Just use the formula for magnification, plug in our numbers, and it's smaller, right? But we've seen that trend. If you, if you, if you anticipated that, that means you're really no, starting to notice what types of images are formed in what conditions for different lenses, okay? So definitely a little bit smaller than the object itself. Okay, excellent, right? And virtual and upright, by the way, right? Because after all, we know it's diverging, okay? So let's take a look at part D, because now it gets interesting, right? Well, maybe it already was. By what percentage would this magnification change if R1 was decreased by 50%, okay? So R1 is always the radii that applies to the surface on the left or more specifically, the surface on the same side of S, but I'm always gonna draw S on the left, and that is the convention, okay? So, okay, so essentially what I'm saying is I'm gonna take this R, R1, that's this one here, and I'm gonna make it much smaller, so make it like half as long. So this is the new R1, R1 new. Hmm, what effect will that have? What would the picture look like, all right? So now the, the focal length becomes this. So that's all I've done is I've just changed it, just made it half of R1, all the same numbers otherwise, right, okay? Here's the picture. See? So you can really compare. See how R1 is indeed a lot shorter now? See? Much shorter than it was before. Okay? Okay. And when I do that, when I make R1 that much smaller, and I still want to line up more or less these two surfaces, because that's going to tell me, look what happens. Now it's thicker in the middle. Right? So by actually making R1 smaller and making this really bulbous and really pushing our limits of uh, accepting that this is a thin lens after all. But, you know, it's fine. We're still going to simplify it as a thin lens. And it would work fairly well for small angles, by the way. But regardless, but just by th by thickening it that much, right, by making R1 that much larger, forcing it to, to bulge out on that side, I've made myself a converging lens. Okay? So it's kind of neat, right? Just by, just by changing that particular radii, I now have a converging meniscus lens. Not all meniscus lenses are diverging. Okay, excellent. Okay, let's check it, right? 
reality check here. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in, okay? Now what's interesting is now by taking this radius, this, this one half of the original radius, that I'm taking one half of 14.5. So that means I'm actually getting a value for R1 that's pretty darn close to R2. They're not equal to each other and they're, they're different. But since they're so close to each other, I've actually made a very ineffective lens. So I made a lens that does very little refraction. So my focal length is tiny now, okay? So you can see, I kind of drew it here. I have a tiny little focal length, okay? Relative to other distances, even relative to the radii themselves, okay? Okay, and so then my new image distance, I would find by just using the image, the image formula here, and I'd get an image that basically falls at the focal point, which kind of makes sense because the object being, um, you know, 7.7 7 centimeters away, that's, the, that's our object distance. Well, 7.7 .7 centimeters is a lot big, a lot bigger than 45 thousandth of a centimeter, right? So essentially, the rays would be coming in parallel almost. So that means they're focusing onto a real image, a real inverted image that is basically at the focal point of this converging lens, okay? Because that's the thing. Just like mirrors, rays that come in parallel, they focus at the focal point, okay? And again, the, the numbers are so drastically large difference be here. You know, S is so much bigger than F that the focus, so then S prime approximately equals F, okay? Okay, so interesting though, there's the result, right? To other, to more significant figures, they're not exactly equal. All right, so then we're gonna go, go ahead and find the magnification. Okay, so that's just gonna be S prime over S. All right, so it's gonna be, okay, so our, 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 tiny, our tiny S prime, our original rel, rel, relatively large S. So that means our magnification factor is really, really small. Our image is gonna be tiny, right? If this is our original object, our image is gonna be like a little dot, okay? So the percent change in the magnification factor would be the new magnification factor minus the original one divided by the original one times 100 to make it a percent. Okay, so we go ahead and plug in our values and you end up with 101% change in magnification factor. That's because originally, you know, we had some magnification where we had an object, you know, that was like, that was here. And then we had an image that was a little bit smaller, right? It was 80, you know, 84% is big, right? And now we have a magnification factor where we have a real image that's, that's tiny compared to the object. So we've essentially taken, you know, an, uh, an image that's fairly large to an image that's hardly even noticeable. So that's why we have a reduction of 101%, though. Why greater than 100%? Well, that's because the greater than 100% part, it represents that it got not only shrunk down, but flipped upside down. So the actual difference in the height can take into account that now it's, it's flipped upside down would be greater than 100%. Okay? All right. Excellent. This concludes our lecture on images formed by thin lenses. I hope it has been both interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.